the praise. The praise be the weapon that silences the enemy. The praise be the weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it church for young adults, the mezzanine. We're so glad that you're here, 18 to 29-ish, and uh, it's going to be an incredible night because we're going to learn about Jesus, who he is, what he did for us, and who we are through him because of what he did for us. Can we do that? Can we worship Jesus and learn about him tonight? Praise his name because he's worthy of it. Let's worship.
tried so hard to see it Took me so long to believe it That you choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection can never earn it You give what we don't deserve it you take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. I am who you say I am. You crown Breathe.
won the victory. You alone, Jesus. Yours is the victory you've given me. We don't deserve Jesus. We give what we don't deserve Jesus. Holy oh, name is high, high above all the names.
Wow. We pour out our praise to you, God. It's your breath in our lungs. I can't even, I'm so overwhelmed by the words tonight. God loves us so much. He gives us life. He gives us breath. We pour out our praises before him. And I just want you to know right now, despite everything you've gone through in life, the highs and the lows, in those darkest of moments, just know that he loves you. He loves you so much. He sent his son to die on the cross for you and for me. That's powerful. As somebody outside of us would just care that much, that they would love us. You're loved. And that's the message I hear tonight is God's reaching out saying, I love you. Welcome to the Mez. Uh, <laughs> this is the church for young adults. And uh, on your way back to the seats, just give everybody a nice chaw. Hello, Mezzanine. What are you guys, how are you guys doing tonight? Yeah. All right. This is going to be incredible tonight. Pastor Dave is going to bring it to you guys. It's just, I'm so excited. I'm pumped up, fired up, super excited. Um, I don't even need this. We're blessed to be a blessing. I'm joking. I'm not actually going off script. I'm just messing. It's all right here. So anyway, I just uh, for that. So I'm just going to read the word of God and let this speak to you, okay? We're talking about tithing, talk about giving. So let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. Go and do 2 Corinthians 9, 6. I'm reading from the NLT. Just hear these words. Just receive them. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, you know. It's like 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus uh, yeah. So um, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. You must decide. So that's between you and God, but you have to decide. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. <laughs> yes, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. As a result of your ministry of giving, uh, they, being the people you're blessing, will give glory to God for your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And they'll pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given to you. Thank God for this gift, too, as well. Uh, too wonderful for words. Thank you for grace. So that's, that's the message for tonight. And uh, let me pick this up again. We have announcements. So, ushers, ush. Mezzanine, how are 
are you guys doing? Yeah? Did everybody have a good week? All right. Okay. Um, so I'm Lindsay. And I'm Reba. And we're going to bring the announcements to you guys. Yeah. So Reba has our first announcement. What is that announcement, Reba? So if this is you guys' <laughs> first time here, we'd love to get to know you and we'd love to get connected with you. So let me hear it from our fanny packers. Stand up if you've got a fanny pack. All right. So these are the people you're going to want to look for at the end of the service. They got a connection card and maybe even a little surprise for you, so make sure you find them at the end of service. Yeah, so cool. We have super neon fanny packs that are just super stylish and go with every outfit. So go find one of those to get connected. Um, the next announcement is serve teams. Um, we have this thing called pregame that happens every week at 6 p.m. Um, and basically it's just we come together, hang out for a little bit, play a game. It's actually really fun. And pray a little bit over the service. And then we kind of break out into like serving. So there's ushers, fanny packers, if you really want to wear a neon fanny pack. You can do that. Um, and then greeters and all the things. So serve teams are an incredible way to get plugged in and make community and just meet people that are young adults your age. It's a really cool opportunity. So definitely sign up for a serve team. And if you're wondering how to do that, back to the neon fanny packs. <laughs> all right. And so if you guys would like to stay connected and stay up to date with everything we have going on at Mezzanine, we do have social media. Who likes social media? Okay, you guys are lying. Let me hear that. There we go. So we have both a Facebook and an Instagram. You can find us at mezzanine.church and stay up to date with all the events, things like open mic night or any outside events that we may have. Yeah, we do a lot of fun things, lots of parties or small group events and all the things. So definitely follow us on any of the social medias. And that's all for us. So enjoy the service. Come on, man. You guys doing good? I'm pumped. I'm pumped. I'm pumped. So this rarely happens to me, but it happened last week. It actually happens to me all the time in life, and that is I got preaching halfway through a message, uh, preaching uh, Ed Sheeran's Bad Habits in the My Playlist series, and what happened was is I only got halfway through the message. And I was like, man, I've already been talking for like 40 minutes. I need to get off this platform. This is for forever. And I still had a whole nother half of the message. And then when I got home, the Lord confirmed that with me because my wife told me so. She was like, you had a whole nother message that you, you could have started off with. So I want to pick back up where we left off last week. But I got to give you a kind of synopsis of what you missed so you can understand where we're going with this. Because tonight, tonight. We're going to be in agreement, which if you're new, that's just Christianese. Well, I guess the word agreement is not Christianese. But what we do with it is, is that we're going to believe God's doing something tonight. You guys with me on that? Because you walked in here expecting God to do something, expecting a movement of God. And we're not going to come into the house of God and just have zero expectations. All right? Because each person here right now, you have something you're believing God for. Some of you for to get into certain colleges. Some of you for a new car. Some of you for a boyfriend or a girlfriend. All right? I'm not promising the last one. All right? But you're expecting from God tonight. So we're going to reach out. Right? Because we even sing songs about it. Our God never fails. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our focus and we're going to put it on him. But if you don't understand what I unpacked last week, it might not be as important this week to what I'm going to talk about. Last week, thank you, Ed Sheeran, I talked about bad habits. And it was inside of a My Playlist. It's a music series where we take secular music and we connect it to the gospel. So his new song out, Bad Habits, it was a mediocre at best sermon. I'm just kidding. I, it was really good. But like, I really liked it. So go back if you can. Go to, go to the YouTube page. Go watch that. I really unpack what bad habits look like. But can I tell you something from the bottom of my heart? Can I tell you something that I don't care if you were raised in the church? Or you got saved this morning at one of our locations. 
What's killing you isn't your bad habits. And often what's wrong with a lot of churches and believers isn't bad habits. It's bad believing. I say bad believing. It could be very well what's root of hurting your faith walk in life. So I didn't want to just rush on to the next sermon series. We got a dating series coming next. And then after that, I am so stoked. I'm doing a spinoff of Marvel's What If. And we're going to do a What If series. Okay, any comic nerds in the house? All right. So that's going to be an incredible series. But let's pray and then let's jump in to tonight's message. Father, whew, we set our eyes on you. We are the branch, you are the tree trunk. We just remove all distractions now. Who is here and who is not here is irrelevant. Irrevel- it doesn't matter. <laughs> we're not here for other people. We're here for you. We're here for us. This is our moment with you. Help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Bad habits. Bad habits. I wrote this. Bad habits will keep you from grow- growing. Bad believing will stop you from living. And what happens is, as believers, as, can we even say that? Like, believing. Be- we are believers. Like, that is like a, a, a very forefront thing when it comes to Christianity. Even how we identify as our, ourselves. We describe ourselves. We're like, oh, I'm a believer. You know? That's, that's just way, that's, that's in our language. But listen to this in Hebrews but without faith, Hebrews 11, 6, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Believing is critical. Believing is critical. We've got to get this down into our heart. We've got to, we've got to get into this, into, into who we are. To paint a picture of like this. How many people here, there's usually two types of people, right? And then we, like, kind of coagulate and hang out. There's the planners and the people that show up, all right? You guys feeling me? How many planners do we have? If you're wondering if you're a planner, you already know what, thank you for the honesty, you already know what you're doing next weekend. You know what you're doing for, actually, when I was pursuing Nancy, all right, which is just like a Christianese word to say I wanted to date her, and... <laughs> And I'm like, oh, yeah, it would be like Monday. I'm like, what are you doing Friday night? She's like, it's Monday. What do you mean what am I doing Friday night? I'm like, no, I'm trying to get you on lockdown. Yes, I'm trying to get this on the calendar. No, because I'm a planner. I'm a planner, right? Nancy's not. Nancy's very spontaneous. So she's like, I'm not making any plans. I'm like, whatever. But what do you do when you make plans? You're believing. You're believing that person will show up. You're believing that person will be a part of what you're doing. You're believing that that person wants to be with you, wants to be around you, that something will happen. And as your life and your story goes on, you can believe in certain things relatively easy, right? We know that Taco Bell is going to be open at 2 a.m. Can I get an amen? Why are you guys doing out at 2 a.m., huh? What's up with that? You know if you don't turn in your work, your professor might fail you. Don't need an AM for that. Amen for that one. There's some stuff that believing, believing comes kind of naturally with us. It gets kind of trained into us. So now it's kind of like just how it is. But when it comes to God, it's incredibly difficult. For some of us, it's incredibly difficult. And the, here's the worst part about it. Here's what here's what here's what here's one of the things where we struggle when it comes to actual believing is that we get wrapped up in a church culture that we can't be authentic in and share where our doubts are and where we're struggling so that we can learn to authentically believe more. And without that authenticity of being a follower of Jesus Christ, we actually wind up being closed off to actual real growth and discipleship when it comes to following Jesus. Because some some people are incredibly hesitant to say, you know what, I, I don't know about that. So I got tonight, there's going to be two things, just two areas. I know if this was a good down-home message, I'd have like five points I would make. I'm only making two points tonight. That's it. The band's coming back up. 
Some of y'all are going to the bathroom. We're going to do some more worship, and then we're going to call it a night. Let me share this scripture with you. We know that it is impossible to please God without believing in God. And that's where our faith extends out, okay? I don't know about you, but I want to be a person that their life pleases God. That their life pleases God. You might say this, I want to be rewarded by God. And yeah, I do too. But more than wanting to receive the blessing from God, I want to please my Father. I mean, I look at my life right now, I look at my wife, I look at my kids, I look at all of you. I mean, like, how much more can you bless me? You've already blessed me so abundantly. I want to please you. So if I'm going to live a life that makes my king and my heavenly father happy, I want to know how. You guys with me on that? Because guess what? You can make all the money in the world. You can't take it to heaven with you. You can have the fanciest title. You can live a life where you know what, you just got everything you wanted. Boom, you post to Instagram, one million likes instantly. That don't mean nothing in heaven. That's eternity. I want to I wanna do something now that's going to last for eternity. These two areas, so important. We have to understand. Mark 1. 40 through 45, says this. Let me put my old man glasses on. It says, now a leper came to him, imploring him. And I read this last week. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. I am willing be cleansed. You see, this leper lived his, his life as a normal person with hopes and with dreams and with goals until he looked down one day and something had happened. He maybe had a spot, a rash, something he didn't know. And as it would grow, he would later identify that it would be leprosy. But it was more than just a painful moment or an awkward scenario. It would mean that his wife, his children would never see him again. He would lose his job. He would have to go out of the city and be banned from ever seeing or having human contact again because his very presence meant that death could get on another person. So he's banished instantly. We don't know how long he was living his life, but as you have leprosy longer, it literally eats away the flesh from your body. Now it says, now a leper came to him. That was against the law. He could not do that. Imploring him. So he's speaking right to God. Kneeling down to him. Saying to him, what is he doing? He is diligently seeking God. He's diligently seeking. He's not saying, you know what? Uh, uh, it, it's, it's hard to wake up early in the morning. Or I don't like going to church. Christians are weird. Or oh, the, the pastor just yells at people and he's, he's bald. Like, no. Oh, I strike two people. He could have died. What would you do to be close to God? I hate to do this, but I got to put a little bit of reality here for us. Anybody here got, uh, you guys, we got, we got Apple phones? All, right, all you people better be tithing. All right, everybody with Galaxy, Samsung, all the rest. All right, there's grace. You have your Bible right on your phone. There's countries you could die for that. But we wake up every day with nothing stopping us from diligently seeking him. And if some other churches from some other countries sat in here with us, they would be like, we worship the same Jesus? Because their definition of diligent is different than ours. But I want to diligently seek that pleases my Father, that for me to go to him, nothing will stand in my way. That man could have died for throwing himself to just beg Jesus saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed, be cleansed. You see, when Jesus, 
When Jesus is looking at you, he's not judging you. He's not angry at you. He's not upset with you. He's not like, oh, there, there they go again. They messed up again one more time. They prayed last week about this. I already forgave them once. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to close off my love for that person. I'm going to become distant from that person. They're going to need to take some time and earn some trust back. You see, that's what we do as humans. That's not what the Messiah does. You see, you were taught that way of a relationship and of love. My Bible says that Jesus was moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing to be cleansed. The first part of your notes, if you are a note taker, the point number one is if you are going to walk with a belief and you're going to walk with strong believing, you have to know in your heart that God is willing. That God is willing a lot of people don't get down into their heart that God is willing to move, that you might be here, you might have lost your virginity, you might have been, you might have gone off the deep end sexually, you might have, you might have still have same-sex attraction, you might be struggling with just a ton of sins and stuff in your heart, and you're thinking to yourself, I know God is real, and I know Jesus is good, but the problem is, I know I'm corrupt, and I know that I'm bad, and I know that, that, that he's good, but he's good for for good people and he's saying no because when this world was at its worst point he went to the cross for us and that's the truth when he sees you he's moved with compassion are you willing to move towards him are you willing to do what it takes to get into his presence because too often we're we're quick to move to what pleases us and makes us happy instead of what we need that will make us whole. You see, that lever had to get within touching the distance of Jesus. Is your only time that you hear about Jesus for 45 minutes on a Sunday night? That's not enough proximity. And I'll tell you this. I do believe it only takes one moment. Don't get me wrong. Don't stop pressing it. If you're like, yo, pastor, it takes everything in my life to get here to hear the message. Good on you, all right? Just like the widow's might. Your diligence and someone else's diligence cannot be compared to each other. You want to fail as a Christian? Start comparing yourself to other Christians. It's a horrible idea. But you know in your heart. You know in your heart. He's moved with compassion. Too often when I turn on and I, the, the TV, I don't, when I see the representation of Christianity, I don't see a God that's being portrayed as being moved with compassion for his people. Because sometimes we, we've lost focus of what we're here for. You know, we're not here to make America the most perfect country in the world. Jesus didn't come to make Israel the most perfect country country in the world. They got wiped out after he left. He was here to bring dead people to life and bring a light into the darkness. And we can't ever forget that. Wherever you go, you're, you are called. Whatever that purpose might be wrapped in, it is in the same as we see in John 1 where he says he was the life and the light to all men. That's what we're here for. Why? Because in heaven he looked down and was moved with compassion. As soon as they had spoken, immediately leprosy left him and he was cleansed. I love that. One vulnerable moment with Jesus. One vulnerable moment with Jesus. And you just see sickness and, and a death sentence being pardoned right then. And he strictly warned him, sent him away at once and said to him, See, you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, offer for you, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded. Believe it or not, this seems boring, but this is actually a very important part of Scripture. We'll get to it in a minute. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely and spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in a deserted place. And then came, they came to him from every direction, from every direction. Man, do you know how much belief is going on right now? There's so much belief. What is this? Jesus believed that there was hope for the leper. 
Jesus believes there's hope for your life. You might have had an abortion. You might have had more than one abortion. And it's hard for you to sit in a church right now because you don't know. And same with homosexuals. It's hard for them to sit in churches because you never know when the preacher's going to spin on you and drop that foot down and make you feel shame. There's no shame coming in this church. There's no shame. You're home. He gave that person hope. He's here to give you hope and peace. Do you believe that he is willing to? Or do you believe that the cross was not enough to pay for all of your sins? Jesus believed that the leper was a person and that person was made in the image of God and had value and has, his, has value. Jesus didn't stop walking when a man with a death sentence disease came at him. He didn't even step backwards. He didn't care about no COVID-19 social distancing. He didn't put no mask on. He said, boom, you're cleansed. Are there people in your life that you know need the gospel, but for some reason we're social distancing from them instead of bringing them to church? So they can be healed. Instead of maybe, you know what, even being crazy and stepping out of your comfort zone. And when they're going on one of their complaining streaks, you say, can I pray for you? Can we pray together? You're like, listen, we ain't got time to wait for Sunday. Let's do this right now. If you think you need to wait for mezzanine, it's because you believe I might be the answer. And I'm here to tell you right now, I am in no way, shape, or form the answer. You are the life and the light to men. You carry it just as much as I do. What are you believing? Because if you believe he's willing, how many of y'all, when your car breaks down, the first person you text is your dad? A lot of you being awful quiet in this church. Thank you, Maddie, for being the one faithful, honest person here, okay? All right, all right, in all fairness, who is the first person mom? Raise your hand if it's mom. Okay, mom gets the text. Why? Because you know they are willing. They are willing. It's okay. You own, an, you own an iPhone. It's okay. Do you know God's willing? Do you know God cares? Do you know that your story is important to him? He's the one writing it if you let him. Man. The leper believed Jesus could heal even his deepest sickness. There's people now that you were sexually abused by people that were supposed to protect you and raise you and love you. There were positions of authority and they did damage and they might still be in your life right now and you can't say nothing and the wound has been buried so deep and it was cut so deep. I'm here to tell you this from the bottom of my heart, what happened to you as a child was not your fault. It was not your fault. What an adult did to you when you were a kid, you are not to blame for that. And you know you have a deep, dark secret inside? Jesus cares about that. He can heal that. Are you willing to give that to him? Are you willing to reach out to him? Are you willing to say, listen, I can't take this anymore? You might be overly sexually promiscuous, and the truth is you're actually the victim of a sexual crime. But you've labeled yourself not something now. You've allowed other people to label you something. And the truth is, you just started believing a lie of the enemy. And getting refocused in and believing that you serve a God that can heal the deepest wounds. The leper believed. Man, this one's, this one's my favorite. The leper believed that he was safe in the presence of Jesus. You know, as believers, we are called to facilitate that environment to people. Don't get me wrong. I love to fight. That's not good to be a preacher and love to fight. I love to challenge. I love to rip stuff from the darkness and bring it straight into the light. I don't even care. Let's do it. But you have to make somebody feel safe first. 
You have to make somebody feel. It's our job to make them feel safe if they're struggling, if they're hurting, if they've got nowhere to turn, and they are being vulnerable to you. you got to let that person know that they're safe with you. Sharing some things that could be criminal, that's been devastating. Too often as believers, we say the stupidest stuff back to people. Like, well, we'll just give it to God, man. Come on, let's go. No. Maybe, maybe hanging out with your friends that night wasn't the most important thing. Maybe you need to take that friend aside and you guys pray together and you talk together about what's happened. But you got to get down to that deep wound and you got to make sure they feel safe. There's not a surgeon on this planet that would go to do open heart surgery and then allow the person to just flop around. They're never like, hey, drink a rock star. Yeah, you don't need any pain medication. Let's do this. No, but as believers... With a wounded world, we don't create an environment where someone could be safe. And we have the great physician with us. So important. So important. I'm just going to say it one more time. The leper believed that he was safe in the presence of Jesus. And I'm going to say this. And I've been saying this for 10 years as I've been the ordained pastor of this, this ministry called the Mezzanine. If you are struggling with sin and you come talk to me, you're safe. You're safe. I'm not kicking you off the worship team. You're not going to have to call the church roster and tell them that you're a sinner. Oh, man, they're all sinners. You're safe. But you're going to have to trust me that we can take the proper steps for you to get healing. All right? You trust me. I trust you. We all trust Jesus. And we're all safe. And I've done this several times. I've done this several times. Is it ever easy? Absolutely not. I sat there for a half hour while a young man cried one time. He couldn't even talk. He just cried for a half hour. So no, this ain't easy. But this, this is what love thy neighbor looks like. All right? It's not just walking up and saying God loves you. Do people believe, do people believe that Jesus is safe? Do you believe that you're safe with Jesus? I'm here to tell you yes. I love the C.S. Lewis quote that now jumps in my head. I don't know why I always do that, like contradictory thoughts when I'm preaching. Is God good? Yes, but he's not safe. That means he's going to stretch you, but he's safe when it means for your healing. When it comes to your healing, absolutely, absolutely. Man, the leper believed that he was safe in the presence of Jesus. Because if you are struggling with a sin, all right, it comes down to one underlining thing. You believe a lie. You have to find the lie and replace it with the truth of God. All right? You have got to do that. I love that the Bible says, hold on a second. If, if, if you think that you're going to be able to earn salvation? No, 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 no. You're not going to earn salvation. That's way above your league. That's way above your league, okay? You can't earn that. That's actually a gift of, uh, through grace, all right, for you. See, we don't even deserve the salvation we get. But in that salvation is the ability to be free from the lies that have pierced into our hearts. One of the big ones is that sex equals value. Sex equals value. Either being sexually attractive or being sexually active. That that equals value. That I have worth then. Guys want me. So you know what? The, the sexier I am, the more they want me, which means the more value I have. That could not be farther from the truth. Sexual attraction is the shallow end of attention and love. When your heart's crying out for the deep, true love that you were designed and meant to have. You're meant to have it with your husband. You're meant to have it with your wife. You're meant to receive it from your heavenly father. But we exchange love for lust because we live in a society that has lied to us to tell us that they're interchangeable. You never hear war stories of soldiers fighting because they lusted for something. You never see men doing incredibly romantic things because they lusted for something. It's because there was a deeper love there. But our culture tells us lust and love are interchangeable. And that is a big lie. That is a big lie. And believe it or not, 
your, your sexual walk is probably one of the most powerful things that you need to protect in your story because the benefit that you get from doing it the way God designed you is incredible. And that's the number one area that the devil wants to attack. Why do you think, now I'm going to get on my soapbox, bring that soapbox. Why do you think pornography is so filthy? Why do you think gossip is so bad, but yet when someone starts, I'll start in the shallow end. We're going to go back to the porn thing. I'm not done with that. All right. Why do you think when someone starts gossiping? I'm, a, I'm a stinking pastor and I'll still do it. And I know, Aspen, I know we should not be having that conversation because we are gossiping about somebody. But for some reason you like feel it in your body. You don't want to like leave. Can I get an amen from every girl in the house? And boy, fine, every boy too. What about pornography? You return to it. Like a dog returns to its vomit, a fool will return to his folly. The Bible says. When you look at pornography, when you're finished, you feel horrible. You feel shame. You feel like, oh. and then you tell yourself, I'm never doing that again. I'm never doing that again. Or you compromise your, your body and you have sex outside of marriage. You're like, I'm never doing that again. No, no. Well, what happens? You do it again. And then you do it again. Why? Because you've bitten into a lie. And then it gets even worse to find out later one of the major porn, uh, porn websites that I believe there's 70% of the women that are on it are being raped and drugged, but yet it's still a billion dollar industry. Why? Because we believe we need the pleasure to sustain our life instead of getting the filth out of our country. It's like, oh, you don't understand. You don't understand, Pastor. You know, it'll be different when I get married. No, it won't. Because you believe the lie that that's okay or you can control that or it's okay in this certain container. And it's not. It's never okay. Sin is never okay. Sin is never okay. We have to understand that sin in its nature is rooted in our flesh to pull us towards a lie that is meant to kill us. So if you're struggling with sin tonight, you have to know you serve a God that is willing to and has paid the price for your total freedom from every sin. Matter of fact, if you, believe it or not, uh, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to drink some water. i got a whole other story to talk about, and then we got to sing some more songs. Right, Shanna? You have to know. That if you're struggling with something, God wants to set you free. And I'm falling apart like a $2 suitcase up here. This is not my normal podium. He wants to set you free. He is moved with compassion. And he is willing. Check this out. You ready for the next part of your notes? Wow, that sounded like a college class. I would love to be an actual college professor. That would be so incredible. Everybody would pass my class if they laughed at my jokes. You passed. That's all I needed. Nancy called me out on that one time. She was like, you only hang out with people that laugh at your jokes. I'm like, you got me. That's why, you, that's why you're in the circle, Maddie. I'm joking. Here's you ready. This next one. First one, he is willing. He is willing. Say he is willing. This next one is just as important. You have to believe that he is able. You have to believe that he is able. Mark 11, 12 through 14, and then we're going to skip over and do 20 through 24. I only do that for the context. There's a chunk of scripture that does not pertain to this, but it, it that's the only reason I'm cutting that chunk out, all right? We're going to look at the, the fig tree. Now, the next day when they had come out of Bethany, he was hungry, that he is Jesus. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. It was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. 
people dropped down some verses. Now in the morning they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed had withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, this is straight 101 Jesus right now. He does this. He is like, he like he's like, hey, the fig tree, so cool. Like, Jesus, Rabbi, look at that. And then Jesus is like, let me tell you the truth of all creation. He's like, you could have gave us a warning, Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he say will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Believe that you receive them and you will have them, but that's not standing by itself because he'll tell you right now, based off this conversation, he'll say, have faith in God. Jesus walks up to this fig tree. He sees from afar that there is leaves coming off this tree, which the way the fig tree works and operates is the leaf is meant to cover the fig. So when you see the leaf, you know there's a fig, you know you can eat. There's food. It would be like henceforth Taco Bell sign being lit up and the lights on and you pull to the drive through and they're closed. Looking at you, Chick-fil-A on Sundays. But we support you. I'm not talking bad about Chick-fil-A. I know my line. So he walks up. He sees the leaf. There should be the fig. It was a lie. And people debate over this. I, I could care less. There was no figs there, and the leaf was the design by God to make sure the fig was covered so it can be eaten. And it wasn't there. Jesus said, no, no one's going to eat from you again because you are a lie and you are outside my Father's design. What in your life is a lie that is pulling you from what God made you for? And are you willing to look at it and say, you are not going to operate anymore in my story? Do you have a friendship? that I get it. We want to get Jesus to everybody. Absolutely. Not if it's killing you, though. If every time you hang out with that dude, you, you're, you're driving drunk, you're drinking too much, you're smoking weed, you're taking pills, you're doing stuff, you're, you're, you're maybe talking about women the way you know you aren't raised to talk about women, guess what? That's a lie, and you're outside your design. And if you ain't leading them somewhere, you might want to check yourself because it looks like they're leading you somewhere. So you might need to tell that fig tree, no, 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 no. Ain't nobody in my story eating from you anymore. You're done. You're done. But what about getting God to him? God is a big God. He can get them. All right? And if you've been pointing to Jesus and they just keep pointing to White Claw, you choose your God, they choose theirs. We can pray for him. We'll get to that in a minute, though. But there has to be a point where if you're being pulled out of your purpose and your calling from your Savior, cut that thing loose. I don't care if you're 21. If you drink too much, then you drink too much. And you know how? Someone probably going to tell you you drink too much. At least I hope so. Nobody ever tells that to a really sober person. Thank you, Wyatt, for that gasping laugh. I didn't know if you were choking. I was concerned. I understand. It says here, Jesus cursed it. What does that mean? It means he, he separated it. He got away from it. He shut it down. You have to believe that God is able to move in your life, but you cannot be okay with just anything moving and living in your life. You gotta be able to shut some stuff down. It's important. The focus needs to be that God will and can do it, that He is our focus. That means we need to be okay with His timing. That's the biggest thing for us these days, is that we are a culture of people that need instant gratification, that we need it instantly. We don't wanna wait for nothing. You're like, oh my gosh. Four years to get a, a, a four-year degree? No, I'm going to 
try and do it in two years or three years and just drive myself. No, no, no. Put the effort towards it. Put the work towards it. You see, things take time. But when it comes to God, when he is our focus, part of the faith journey is understand that God is the power and the source, but he is also the one who's making the schedule. So if you are praying for a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you ain't got one yet, don't be mad at God. And don't be trying to take the wrong one just so you won't be lonely. Guess what? On February 15th, nobody cares about Valentine's Day anymore, right? You just got to make it to February 15th. We wind up making what's pulling on us bigger than the one who's actually providing for us. But you see, when you realize that God is the one who's going to bring the breakthrough, you're going to trust in the timing on what he's going to do. Notice he didn't keep going back. He didn't say, and Jesus went back to check the fig tree. Nope. He already went on. He went on. He was moving. He's like, no, I got stuff I got to do. It was the disciples that saw that the fig tree, that the fruit of what happened to it. And then they called it out. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, guess what? If you ask, you're going to get it. We have to trust God and his timing. And he would say this to him. He'd say, he'd say, I sh- for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. Man, that mountain and cast into the sea. He's saying that. But he's trying to say, hey, listen, as, as, as people of faith, you know what we do? We like to put things in boxes and containers so we can understand it in our head and in our heart. And that's why I labeled this, God is able that he is willing and God is able. Why? Because the second I teach what the word of God says, we're going to try to make that word of God fit our life. Instead of making our life fit the word of God. He said, hey, you know how powerful this is when you connect with my father and he becomes your source and you put the faith in him? That mountain you could throw in that ocean. There was nothing bigger in the first century than a mountain and an ocean. Mountains also to a Jew represented problems. They knew that. That was like the pictorial reference for a problem or a struggle in your life. And he was also saying, when you trust in my God, when you trust in your Father, you can say to that problem in your life, be it removed. And it's got to go to the depths of the forest place, into the ocean. That there is no problem in your story, in your life, that you can't bring to your heavenly Father. None. None. Don't doubt. Now that's a tough one. Anybody here struggle with doubt? You ever look up at the stars? And you're like, there's no way there's not aliens. I think that. I mean, I don't think it right now. But I've thought it. Do you ever watch, like, the History Channel or Discovery Channel, and they show, like, Hinduism or Buddhism, and you're like, wow. You know, the one billion Chinese people can't be wrong, can they? I mean, if this was a popularity contest, Christianity is not the number one, you know, religion on the planet. What if, what if they're right and I'm wrong? These are real thoughts. What if you're like, man, I'm watching all this science stuff, and what if we really did just evolve from monkeys? But then why do we still have monkeys? Don't start with a mountain. All right. If you've been on your Instagram, you've been doing all that stuff, I get it, but I need your attention back now. This is critical, critical, and then we'll call the band up. All right. This is critical to you to you getting this. He said, say unto the mountain, be a thou removed. Now you can hear that in a lot of places about talking about just speak what it is, just speak into just speak into existence, and then you struggle because you're thinking about aliens and monkeys and all this other stuff, and, and you're like all over radar. You're like, oh, no. Start small with activating your faith. And then write it down. I'll never forget the first time I, I really was like, God got me on this. this. Uh, any control freaks here? I'm a control freak. All right? So I got to control everything. All right? So I'm like, I got into a ton of conflicts, and I was massively stressed out. And God was like, you know what? Just pray for that conflict. Pray for that one. 
I mean, this was not earth shattering, but there was nothing I could do about it, you see. And what I did was, every day when I got up, instead of trying to find a way to figure this out, and this problem was not curing cancer, this problem was not winning the lottery, this was just a small interpersonal problem. He's like, pray for the person, pray for the person, pray for the person. I mean, that seems simple, but guess what? That person, without me doing anything, reached back out to me and said the most impossible thing you could ever hear from a 20-year-old. I'm sorry. I didn't do anything. What I actually did was stop trying to have control, and I actually prayed it over to God. Because the just shall live by faith. And as a pastor, I have much bigger problems, and I'm sure so do you, than a small situation like that. But that was a small mountain. Now I have the faith for a bigger mountain, and then a bigger mountain, and then a bigger mountain. That I can say, oh, if he, if I, if, <laughs> man, if I pressed into my Savior, he delivered me from that. He delivered me from that. There was breakthrough in that. There was breakthrough in that. Now I get it. We all evolved from space monkeys. That's fine. But my God's real and is showing up. So I'm going to stay faithful to, to, to my Jesus. That's how you do this. That's why debating's stupid. People are like, well, as Christians, we should go debate. Why? Why? It's the, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, we shall overcome. That's what we need to be focused on. That testimony when someone says, is your God real? And they're like, prove it. I'm like, man, look at my wife. Look at my kids. Look at my church. Look at the fact that he has moved through all that. You want to? How about this? I'll buy the Starbucks if you give me the time, and I'll tell you my testimony and how my God is real. And that's where the faith comes for moving a mountain. This isn't blab and grab. This isn't, Jesus isn't saying, hey, if you, if you just speak it and believe God for it, he's going to give you a Ferrari it isn't that. It's not the prosperity gospel. But I also don't want you leaving here powerless to what God can do and is able to do in your life. If you're believing for restoration in a marriage, God can do that. If you're believing for restoration in a relationship, if you're believing, you could go right down the line as the Holy Spirit is whispering to your heart right now. God is saying to you, I can do that. I am able. Do you believe I am able? You say, will you make Stacy fall in love with me? He's like, but I won't do that. But I do have a wife for you. Because he who finds a wife finds a good thing. But do you trust me? God, can I have that job right there? You can have a job where you prosper. But do you trust me? See, this is the just to live by faith in us knowing our God is willing and our God is able. Can we have the band come back up here? Because this last portion, this last portion, I want to share with you guys. He says this. He says, Doubt comes in because we allow distance in our story between moments where we need God. Doubt comes in because you allow distance to come in on the last time you actually needed God. Yay, first, first world faith problems. Come on, the real is what it is. Why? We ain't going to starve to death. We have Publix. We do. We got a food pantry right here. If you, if you are going to starve to death, we get you food tomorrow 9 a.m. You see, it's crazy when your necessities are met. How much of God we become in our own life? You see, I don't want to do that. I want to be found diligently seeking him. But then he closes and says this in his last moments as he's telling them and giving them a picture of what it means to move mountains, to what it means to have a faith, what it means to be in a walk with your Savior. Oh, I'm on some good stuff now, huh? Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, when you pray, when was the last time you prayed 
honestly and earnestly prayed, stopped your life and prayed, got into his presence and prayed, that guess what? Your phone could wait, Spotify could wait, friends could wait, sleeping can wait, that you said, no, this moment is now for my father and I'm going to give him my full attention and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Some of you might be saying, well, I pray when I drive down the road. You're too busy. You're too busy. That's a huge red light. You're too busy. And your school and your job and your friends are not that important. And I'm talking to the choir right now, all right? Because we're kidding ourselves if we think we're going to have a blessed life when we take the one who is the blesser and we cut him out from any of our time. Oh, I'll put, a, I'll, put a, I'll put a song on pray while I drive. That's the only chance I got. No, it's not. No, it's not. Not if we're honest with ourselves. Not if we valued the person. If that was an attractive boy or girl and they wanted a moment, you would make time. You would make time. And I'm not trying to compare God to a romantic relationship, but I'll say this. It's incredible what you can do with your life when you truly value who and what you want in it. So don't tell me you don't have time to pray. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. I would pray, but you don't understand the things I've done. You don't understand who I am. You don't understand my walk. You don't understand what's going on. I'm in a dark place. I do understand. Man, I totally understand. Most of the blessings and breakthrough of my life have come when I've been in the craziest places. But God has always shown up because he is the one that brings the breakthrough. I just bring the obedience. Jesus didn't go to the cross so you could become perfect. Jesus went to the cross so you could become righteous. We're all going to be working on getting the sin out of our life until we enter through the gates of heaven. We have to understand that James would write, confess your trespasses one to another, pray for one another that you may be healed. And then he would say this. He says, hey, what? Get that sin out. Get together as a family. Be in unity. Get the garbage out that you're holding on to. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we hear that and we're like, man, that's great for you, Pastor, that, but that's not me. That's great for, the, for Chris Johnson leading worship, Pastor Chris, but that's not me. But then he doesn't stop. He says, Elijah. And by the way, Elijah was an Old Testament prophet that was so good at his job, he showed back up in the New Testament to give Jesus a high five. Okay, that was my translation. But he's in the New Testament. This is what he says. It's what James says about Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly. What? It wasn't that he was so super holy and perfect? No. He was diligent. He was earnest. He valued God in his life. He believed that he was willing and he believed that he was able. That it would... Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. I don't know what you need from God. I don't know what it is in your story, but I know this, that if you put your belief in Jesus Christ, he is willing and he is able to make all things new, to make you a new creation, to break the bondage of sin in your life, and to have you fully walking in victory. We just have to seek him. And we can't give up. Perfection was never a goal for a Christian. Obedience is. Let's all rise to our feet here. We're going to go into worship songs. We've got two worship songs. And this is what I want you to do because the message isn't over. Just my portion is. And what you're going to do now is what the Holy Spirit has breathed on your heart in these moments. They're going to lead us in some songs. And now I want you to pray. Take these two songs. Is it two songs? I'm saying two songs, but I don't know if it's two. How many songs is it, Shanna? Two. Praise God. I was kind of winging it. And pray.
Just pray. Guess what? He knows. God, I got lust issues. He's like, I know. Finally, we can talk about it. God, I'm lonely. He's like, like, that's not my plan for you. Let's talk about it. But let's take these next two songs. Let's diligently and earnestly just open our hearts to him. See what's hidden under the surface. You see the beauty under the tarnish. You will find it found what you call gold. You will find
just want to thank you right now that even if we don't see it or feel it, God, you're moving. You're moving in our lives and you're moving in the lives around us. You're moving through us. No matter the circumstance, we hand it over to you because we know that your plan is better than our plan. Your ways are better than our ways. So we hand it over to you. Dear Heavenly Father, take it. We give you control of the situation that we're in right now. We give you our hopes. We give you our future, our dreams, our aspirations. They are yours. In the name of Jesus, amen. We serve a good God who cares about us, do we not? All right. So with that, I want us to take this moment and I want to take it out these doors because that's where it's meant to be. Pastor David tonight said that we are the light of this world because we have something shining from within us and that's the light of Jesus Christ. Can we go share him with the world? Let's do it. See y'all next week.